Hey guys, welcome back. This is video number two in the two-part series on Principal Component Analysis, PCA, and Independent Component Analysis, or ICA. ICA is the topic of this video. So much like the last video, I'll start with a brief introduction into the technique, dive into the math a little bit. I will compare the two approaches, talk about their similarities and differences, and then I'll finish with a concrete example of how you can use ICA with some example code provided in the GitHub repository. So let's get right into it. Okay, so the standard problem for independent component analysis is the cocktail party problem. So in its simplest form, you can think of two people having a conversation at a cocktail party. And for whatever reason, you happen to have two microphones kind of set up next to these two speakers. Um, both microphones are going to pick up audio from both of the speakers, uh, kind of like our purple microphone and pink microphones here. Um, the purple microphone is a little closer to the blue speaker, so it picks up more of the blue speaker's audio relative to the red speaker and vice versa. The pink microphone picks up uh, more audio from the red speaker than the blue speaker. So then the problem is how can we take these audio recordings uh, that have both speakers um, kind of side of the conversation mixed together and separate it out um, to two audio files, uh, each of which only contain audio from a single speaker. Well, that's exactly what independent component analysis does. It trans, uh, transforms a set of vectors. Uh, so you can think of uh, the raw or you can think of the recorded audio by these two uh, microphones into a maximally independent set. So, so that's what's being represented here. Um, so you have the purple and pink audio signals, then they get translated uh, to the original, the sources of the uh, audio, which was uh, the speech from the blue speaker and then the speech of the red speaker respectively. So again, the purple and pink are your measured signals the blue and the red are the independent components or the source of the uh, information or the audio. Okay, so there are a couple key assumptions to independent component analysis. So uh, assumption number one, your independent components are statistically independent and that's defined in the typical way in statistics. The joint distribution of two variables x and y is equal to the probability distribution of x times the probability of y. And then the second key assumption is that your independent components are non-Gaussian, which might be a little strange, you know, in statistics and science, we love to say everything's Gaussian and makes things much nicer and it allows us to do a lot of uh, rigorous analysis, uh, but this is one of the instances where we actually need the independent components to be non-Gaussian for this to work. Okay, so we have our measured signals, again, that's from your microphone example, and then the independent components, which is what your speakers are saying in the cocktail party problem. So we can use our independent components, we can combine them in some way, so that's what's being represented by this expression, uh, to kind of recreate our measured signals, x. You can think of the uh, independent components as being sources, hence that's why this vector is an S. They are sources of information or audio that are being combined in some way to generate what's being measured at your microphone, for example. So we have X1 and X2, your measured signals, and then your independent components or the sources of your signals, um, S1 and S2. Uh, but you can also kind of turn this around and you can combine your measured signals to express your independent components. If this is the case, if you can just have some linear combination of your measured signals to derive your independent components, the set of values defined by W is all we need in order to do ICA. Okay, so mathematically, the goal is uh, as follows. So given some uh, measured signals, given some data x, we want to solve for the matrix w such that the set 
of independent components or the set of source vectors s sub i are maximally independent this uh, concept of maximally independent what does that mean how do we quantify that so there are two ways you can define w in such a way that it minimizes the mutual information between all your independent components or you can maximize the non-gaussianity of the independent components defined by uh, this W matrix. Um, I'm not going to go any further than that. If you're interested in more information, check out the blog post linked in the description. I kind of go into a bit more detail uh, on the math. PCA and ICA, they're similar techniques in a lot of ways, but ultimately they're distinct. They are different approaches that kind of aim at different tasks or aim at different goals. So PCA typically compresses information. If you saw the PCA video, the example was hot dogs and hot dog buns. Those are two quantities that are heavily correlated. So instead of representing that information with two variables, you can represent it with just one. And so that's where PCA is um, a good thing to use because it will compress those variables into those two variables into a single variable. On the other hand, ICA separates information. It's going to take two variables, for example, like your two speakers or the, the audio picked up by two microphones placed close to two speakers, and it's going to separate out the independent components or the sources or the independent drivers of those measured signals. So kind of similar, but they are different goals and different final outcomes. Uh, a commonality between PCA and ICA is uh, auto-scaling. So um, this is a critical part of the pre-processing. So auto-scaling is for each variable, you have to subtract the average of that variable and divide each element by the standard deviation of that variable. Um, and then that's one of the reasons why uh, it's typically advantageous to apply PCA to your data set um, before applying ICA because it kind of all the pre-processing is already handled for you. PCA will clump all the information together, the correlated variables, and then ICA will come in and separate out independent drivers if um, it's applicable. Okay, so as always, I'm going to include a concrete example. So here, this is something that, that's relevant to my research, and this is where I kind of came across the whole technique of independent component analysis was to solve this specific problem. In my research, we deal with uh, EEG data. So what is EEG? Uh, EEG is a technique of measuring brain activity uh, by placing a set of electrodes on the head. You know, EEG is a very powerful technique because it has a uh, very good temporal resolution and it's also non-invasive. People can kind of move around with the, this cap on, but that kind of also leads to one of its more fundamental weaknesses is that since the electrical signals that it's trying to measure from the brain are so weak, EEG has to be very sensitive to these kind of fluctuations in voltage, which makes it very prone to artifacts or perturbations, oscillations in your signal that do not come from brain activity. So this could be like blinking, which is the what we're trying to resolve in this problem, or motion artifacts, uh, people talking, or other kinds of noise that can kind of get injected into the data. So here we have a plot of the voltage versus time. Sorry, I should have had labels on these axes, but the y-axis is voltage in millivolts. The um, x-axis is uh, a time index, essentially. And this is for the FP1 electrode, which sits near the front of the head on the left side. So on your left forehead. And so this electrode is particularly prone to blink artifacts because it's the one of the closest electrodes to your eye. And then you can actually see the blinks occurring because you'll have these giant spikes in the signal. So we're trying to get rid of that because with EEG, we're trying to measure brain activity, not uh, blink activity. Okay, so the first step here is uh, applying PCA. So here we have 64 electrodes on our EEG, so that translates to 64 variables. Uh, so we can use PCA to kind of clump that down to just 21 variables. And I just did some trial and error to find the right 
number of principal components to go down to. And at the bottom here, you can see the explained variation is 99.5%. And in MATLAB, it's really simple. You may notice I don't explicitly um, auto-scale the data. That's because the PCA function in MATLAB does this automatically, which is pretty nice. Uh, but it's all done in one line in MATLAB. And it can be done in one line in Scikit, or a couple lines in Scikit-Learn. And if you didn't check out the previous video on PCA, that'll share some example code on how to do that. Okay, and then again, we can apply ICA to the set of principal components that we got from PCA. Uh, so that's what's being done here. So now uh, we can just plot all the independent components. Okay, so again, we had 64 electrodes on our EEG cap. That translates to 64 variables. Uh, we then used PCA to reduce the dimensionality from 64 variables to just 21. And then finally, we applied ICA to those 21 variables to kind of separate out the independent components. And then just looking at this visually, uh, kind of independent component 10, 5, and 12 are reminiscent of those blank artifacts we saw in that initial plot. And again, these aren't the just the independent components uh, themselves or the raw independent components. I actually squared them uh, so that all the values would be positive and then the blink artifacts would be a bit more prominent. Okay, so I just used a rough heuristic. Uh, basically, I picked out the independent components which had four prominent peaks. And so this isn't a robust way to do it. I was doing something fast and wanted it to be repeatable. So it picked out independent components 10 and 12 to correspond to the blinks. Okay, so 10 and 12, I'll buy that. Maybe five should have been included, but we'll see how it turns out. Okay, and then we can essentially just drop independent components 10 and 12 because they contain blink information, which we're not interested in. We only want brain information. So we can drop those two components and then just work backwards. We'll reconstruct our score matrix, um, basically the output of PCA, and then we can reconstruct our original uh, 64 variables by going backwards in PCA. So doing that and plotting everything before the uh, blink removal, FP1 had these four prominent peaks corresponding to blinks. And then afterwards, uh, they went away. So it's kind of like magic. And this is a rough way to do it. There are other ways to do it. But this is more so just as an example of what ICA can be used for. So that concludes the two-part series on principal component analysis and independent component analysis. If you found this video helpful, please like, subscribe, comment, share. I would very much appreciate that, and I would love to hear your feedback. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video, and thanks for watching.